Houston, and I thought it was a joke at first. And then I got the text back, this is not a joke. It's really headed this way. And so after speaking here last year, I uh, stopped at Tom Thumb and bought bread and water on my way back to Houston, left the next morning. And of course, none of us dreamed how bad it was really going to be. We had eight families in the congregation that lost almost everything, and we had 43 other families that had water in their houses to some degree. But the congregation came together in such incredible ways and did so much work and so much good happened through it. So many people were helped. Even people were baptized through it. People who had not been active in the congregation in years got active, and it was really, really wonderful. And you were a part of that, whether you realized it or not, because uh, Waterview sent a very, uh, a very nice gift to help those people in our own congregation as well as those in our community and we say thank you to that because we could not have done what we did without people like you helping us our brothers and sisters throughout the throughout the world did so much we received monetary gifts from churches not only in the u.s but from mexico and india and haiti and that will just bring you to your knees when you know how little so many of those folks have and how much they wanted to help. Now tonight we're going to be talking about a different subject. We're talking about the uniqueness of God in a world of diverse beliefs. I want to stand here just because I don't have a lot of room on the side. I always stand on the side, so I may feel kind of funny tonight speaking. Don't worry, it's not you, it's me, right? And I'm watching my time. What a church, a wonderful church this is where there is not a clock for the preacher. I've never heard of such a thing. They certainly have one in Houston, I can tell you that. But we're talking about the uniqueness of God in a world of diverse beliefs. Incidentally, this photo up here, some of you, if you are from the panhandle of Texas, like I am, grew up in Canadian Texas. This is from that part of the world. Almost that is from somewhere around Turkey or Silverton. And uh, we were on a little trip a couple weeks ago, and our friend uh, took that. We stopped on the side of the road. You wouldn't believe this, but we were there about 20 minutes, and no one drove by. And so, um, but the uniqueness of God in a world of di diverse beliefs, and let me tell you, as you probably know well, the number of beliefs in this country as well as in this world are not getting fewer, they are getting greater. And the uniqueness of God in some ways is becoming greater than it was before because people aren't understanding who God is. There used to be a time, and, and I have had many, many evangelistic Bible studies in my life. I grew up in a family that was very evangelistic, went with my parents on Bible studies every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday nights, and sometimes other nights as well. I was a missionary in Brazil, and so I love evangelistic Bible studies. But where I start with people now, literally, is this is the Bible. There are two parts called Testaments, and there are 66 books in it. 39 on one part and 27 in the other, and that's where we start. And in the last probably 10 people I've had Bible studies with, not a one has, has known that before I shared that with them. We're in a world that is very different than the world I grew up in, and even a world that is different than 12 years ago when I moved to Houston. It is changing fast. And so I think it's extremely important that we understand who God is and how God is different than other gods or things people call gods or put in place of a God. The ancient religions taught that the gods were against people. They all taught that. They all taught that somehow the gods had created people for the purpose of making their lives bad. That for whatever reason, what they were trying to do was just put thing, barriers in the way of people, thump them on the back of the ear, and somehow make their lives really difficult. You may know uh, some of the stories, one of those stories about creation that is obviously not the true story, but it's the story that the Babylonians had by the name Enuma Elish. Some of you might have studied it in school at some point or another. 
But what they taught were things like that the, that the earth was, was, all the gods were against the people and they were, they were drunks and they were incestuous and they did all kinds of things to hurt people. And finally there was this big battle between a couple of the gods who were related and finally Tiamat, this female god, is cut in two and the upper part of her body goes up and becomes the sky and the lower part of her body, her torso, becomes the ground, the earth. And perhaps that phrase, Mother Earth, is the oldest phrase in any language. That people say Mother Earth, perhaps going all the way back to the Babylonians. And you can imagine you wouldn't tell your kids stories about God at night because you would scare them to, de to death. You would be afraid to go asleep if you were telling stories about those gods and goddesses. Yet Israel was being influenced by the Babylonians, kind of like the way we're influenced by Hollywood. And so God lets Moses know the true story of what happened in, in, in uh, creation. And seven times God used the word good to describe the creation in Genesis chapter 1. It wasn't bad, it wasn't e evil, it wasn't deceitful, it wasn't there in order to bother people to make their lives bad. But after every day, God would say it was good. And it was good. And it was good. And the first time something wasn't good, interestingly, maybe you know this, is God said it's not good for man to be alone. But before that, everything was good. Well, world religions, whether they realize it or not, are at odds with God. Now, this doesn't mean that we need to go go and use hate speech toward Hindus or toward Buddhists or Muslims or whoever, obviously we shouldn't do that because we want them to know the same God that we have. We want our God to be their God. We want them to know Jesus. But they're at odds with our God for so many different reasons without even understanding that they're at odds with God. Because God makes an exclusive claim in John 14, 6 and 7, you remember what Jesus said to his disciples. Jesus answered and said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. That is an exclusive claim. He does not say, I am a way. He does not say, I am a truth. He does not say that I am a life. For us today in America to publicly declare that we know the truth is considered outlandish. If you were to go on television and say to a national audience that Jesus is the way, you can better guarantee you will not have a political career or whatever else. Because you can't say that. At least you're told you can't say that. Because who in the world would believe that? Who could claim that? Jesus could claim that. God, the Father, the Creator, could claim that because He's the one who made it. And if He made it, then He can claim it. Because that's who He is. Now, I want you to understand this. Jesus is not part of the answer. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought you just said he was. No, Jesus is not part of the answer. He is it or he's nothing. He is the whole answer or he is nothing at all. I, uh, most of the time when I'm in my car, I'm listening to sports radio about 97% of the time. And back in our days when we lived in Oklahoma, there was, they always had it on, and there was one guy on the, on the sports radio channel that's so, so well known there that uh, now is a national broadcaster, and he's good. But he came from a Jewish background, and he was living in a part of the country that was overwhelmingly Christian, so to speak. And people would ask him about his faith, and this was in the middle of, of, of post-9-11 and all that was going on with that. And I remember one time on the radio, he explained his religious beliefs. He said, what I do is I make a religious salad, he said. 
He said, I take all the good things from Christianity and I put in the bowl, and I take the good things from Judaism and put in the bowl, and I take the good things from Islam and I put in the bowl. And he said, and then I just have this religious salad. You can't have a religious salad. Not and do what God has called us to do. Now, I understand that he's trying to relate to an audience. I know what he's trying to do. But Jesus didn't say that I am part of the salad. Jesus said, I'm the whole meal. Come and eat from me. I am the bread. He said, I'm it. I'm not part of it. I am it. I am the way, the truth, and the life, an exclusive claim. This is a fairly long little uh, quote I want you to see from C.S. Lewis. Most of you know of C.S. Lewis. The greatest, probably, uh, defender of, of, of belief in God of the 20th century. And C.S. Lewis said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about God. I'm, they say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim as God. That is the one thing we must not say. <clears throat> a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, which that's kind of weird, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else he's a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him, you can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. He said, it is only me. If you are going to worship me, you're not going to put me with other things. You're going to put me all by myself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You remember what he also said, no man can serve two masters because you love one and you hate the other. He said, you don't put me alongside things. You put me only. You worship me only. And Jesus is exclusive in our relationship, in the relationship that he has with us. Jesus is completely exclusive. Now, many years ago, when we were missionaries in Brazil, we were there from 92 to 99 and, and uh, in a city called Vitoria, Brazil. Big city, although you probably never heard of it. 1.3 million people there, right on the coast. It's beautiful. It's like a little Rio is what it looks like. And... On New Year's Eve every year, there is a big celebration to the goddess of the ocean called Yamanja. She is an African goddess, Afro-Brazilian goddess. And there's a, there was a big statue just, just maybe two blocks from our house where we lived. We lived close to the water, and it was out over the water. And 20,000 people went down to the beach, and we went down to watch. 20,000 people on New Year's Eve, all dressed in white, went to make sacrifices to Yamanja, asking for a good year. And while they were there, people would gather around in circles and they would sacrifice chickens in the middle of the circle. And there would usually a man, but sometimes a woman, an older woman, would put on a sailor's cap and smoke a cigar, and while, she was, while he or she was doing that, their voice would change, and they would claim that they were speaking to spirits who had, that had died at sea. At sea. My voice is changing. <laughs> but spirits that had died at sea. And I don't know if you believe in that or not, but it was scary just watching it, let me tell you. But as we stood there, I remember watching this one woman. They would take these little homemade boats, and they would put fruit and bottles of wine in the little boats, and they would push them out to sea for this sacrifice. And I remember watching this one woman, young woman, probably in her early 20s, go out and put her boat in the water wearing all white. And when she turned around, she was wearing a shirt that said, Jesus saves. And I thought, how can you do that? 
How can you make a sacrifice to, a, to an idol and then wear on your shirt, Jesus sh saves? And I'm sure if I would have asked her, do you think Jesus saves? She probably would have said yes. How can we do that? Jesus says, have, or God says, have no other gods before me. Jesus said, I'm it. You don't make sacrifices to anyone else or anything else. I'm it. Jesus is exclusive in our relationship. You see, as John and, and uh, Paul said, we are his bride. We are his bride. Have you ever thought about that? The church is referred to as the bride. Jesus as the bridegroom. And it's not like the, that, that the bride said, you know what, Jesus, I love you, and I want to be married to you, but I also want to be married to four or five other people too. What would you have done if your wife or husband would have said as you were getting married, hey, this is going to be great, I'm really thrilled to marry you, but I also want to be married to about seven other people at the same time. You would have said, you can, you can go to Hollywood and make yourself a reality show, but I'll have nothing to do with it, right? Because that's about what that would be. I think it's already been on. Because that's what it is. You wouldn't want that at all. Jesus is completely exclusive in his relationship. He said, my people are my people. Whenever I was about nine years old, I went to church camp for the first time. And I went to church camp many times, but I remember this, this time I was nine. I went to Boiling Springs Camp in Wood, at, near Woodward, Oklahoma. And I remember the camp that year was on the theme was, God is a jealous God. And I don't know if they used lots of phrases to explain that to us, and I just wasn't smart enough or wasn't listening and didn't catch it. But I was confused the entire week. Because I knew that God was a good God that didn't do anything bad, that God was always good, that God was always truth, but I also knew that jealousy was bad. I knew you weren't supposed to be jealous. And all week long, what all the teachers taught about was God is a jealous God, and I left camp very, very confused. And it wasn't until years later I started working through that of what does it mean that God is a jealous God. If you were to go to the mall tonight, afterwards, and some man started talking to your wife, put his hand on your wife's shoulder, and you had not seen that man, you would be a jealous husband. If you saw some woman flirting with your husband, you would be a jealous wife. And you should be. Because there is a covenant that is made between you and your spouse. That is what we call good jealousy. If you saw someone leaving church, holding your child's hand, walking out to their car and getting in it, and it's your child, you would be, in a sense, jealous that someone was taking away your child. That is the way God feels toward us. It is an exclusive relationship. He wants to be with us. We are his, nobody else. He said, I don't want you looking at other gods. I don't want you flirting with, with, with gods or with things that people call material things. I want you just to love me. I want you to focus on me. I want to be a part of your marriage. I want to be a part of your job. I want to be a, I want to be a part of your, of your social life. I want to be a part of everything. I love you. You see, that's one of the things that makes God so unique is you can't bring other things into that relationship because of who he is. And God is unique with all of that because he lives in relationship. There is nothing else quite like God. And you say, well, what do you mean he lives in relationship? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is a different relationship than, than any other type of God in the world has. Is he one? Yes. Is he three? Yes. I thought you said he's one. He is. He is. But he lives in this relationship that makes him unique. And what's so interesting about it is, <coughs> excuse me, God wanted relationship even in the garden. 
Do you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when God went, went at night? You remember after Adam and Eve had sinned? This is really bad, but the story of Adam and Eve sinning is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It shouldn't be, right? But there's so many interesting things about it. For, first of all, whenever God says, where are you? You remember, he obviously knew where they were. And you remember, I'm, I'm chasing a rabbit right now for just a moment. And Adam and Eve said, uh, we hid because we were naked. And God said, who told you you were naked? Can you imagine Adam going, uh... This is just like when you talk to your three-year-old, right? They had not thought about that part of the, of the answer. But God wanted relationship in the garden. As the Bible says, in the cool of the evening, God came to be with Adam and Eve, to talk to Adam and Eve. So he wanted that relationship in the garden, and he also wants to have it with us. God desires to be with us. That's why Jesus became one of us is that he wants to be with us. You know that feeling when someone just wants to be with you? When they just want to spend time with you? You want to hang out with me? I can't even believe that. There was a man that, that I admired very, very much for many years. And I remember one day he called me for breakfast. And I thought, why in the world is he calling me for breakfast? What is it? You know, I was, I was nervous. I thought, what does he want me to do? I made sure I got up early, and, and I was out the door early. I arrived at the, at the restaurant early because I thought, wow. And he walks in, and he's just wearing a pair of sweats, and walks in the door and sits down. And I said, well, what did you want? He said, I just wanted to hang out. I thought, with me? With me? I couldn't believe it. The creator of the world says, I just want to be with you. I want you to be my child. I want you to call me father. I want you to call me Abba, something even more intimate than father. I just want to be with you. He wants us to have that kind of relationship with each other. Now, sometimes we talk about the word fellowship. Fellowship's a great word. The only thing I don't like about fellowship is if we don't ever use it for any other part of our life, only for our church life. So sometimes people don't know what we're talking about. And it always makes me think of potluck dinner anyway, doesn't it you? I mean, a potluck, you know, you're in the fellowship, Paul, right? But he wants us to have relationship with each other. That's what this whole church thing is about. It's about us being with other people who are like we are. Some of you work in places all over Dallas that I'm sure that they're not very godly. Not because you're not godly, but the people that you work with probably aren't very godly. And sometimes it probably feels like that you are far, far away. And what meetings like this do is brings us together and lets us look around the room and say, we are not alone. That there are people that we love, that there are people that want to have a relationship with God, that God cares about us. Back, I guess, it was a, I guess it was about a year ago, we had the opportunity to go to England, and we got to go to lots of places there. And we stopped in lots of, lots of churches there. And one thing I was rem that I saw that made me so sad was that, as you know this, but the church, for the most part, and I use that very generally, is just a, something people used to do in England. Great Britain, Europe. Just a few weeks ago, I was in Washington, D.C. I go away and I work on sermons and I go somewhere kind of interesting and write about wherever I'm at. And so I was in Washington, D.C. for a week or so. And in the city itself, the feeling that I got was that religion was just like it was in England. And I had to hurt the whole time for Christians, of how difficult it must be to proclaim your faith and stay strong, how easy it would be to just fade away, just like it is for people in Dallas or Houston who don't have people to keep them strong. I went to a church service, as a matter of fact, church, the Church of Christ, on Wednesday night. There were nine of us in that huge city. 
And I thought, oh, how I hurt for people. It's not that you have to go on Wednesday night. That's not what I mean by that. But what I mean is we hurt because it's fading away. People don't understand the importance of being together, of knowing Jesus, not just personally, but together as a people. And he and each individual is benefited in relationship. The way God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus work together, you would say in one sense, as one writer put it, they gratify each other, they honor each other, they with each other, they complement each other. The purpose of relationship is for us to help each other, to gratify each other. And I like that old passage in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, when I was a little boy and I heard this this scripture, what it meant was go to church or die. That's pretty much the way we used it. I remember I would say to my mother, do you really have to go on Wednesday, on, on Wednesday night? And she'd say, no, you don't. But you know how disappointed we'll be if you don't go, you know? So what he's saying here is so much more than go or die. That's, that, we're missing the point when we use it that way. He's saying go to church partially to worship God. And, and you understand, I'm using that colloquial, colloquially. I can't say it, but I can write it that phrase but he's saying that not only to worship God in a formal way but to have relationship with each other I've used this before at Memorial I've talked about it I've said at at Memorial I said you know this Sunday we have about 900 usually on Sunday morning I said if we had 900 this Sunday everybody would be excited and be be a normal Sunday if next Sunday we had 700 people looked around and say wow we have a lot of people out of town If we had 500, the next Sunday people would look around and say, boy, something must be going on. The next Sunday we have 200, I won't know because they'll already have sent me away. Because just showing up encourages us. Now sometimes we want want people to be more than just pew warmers, but just being here helps. It is the way God has made us because God in heaven is relational and he intended for his people to be relational. We are to be people who are in each other's lives. Just, it was just a couple of days ago on Facebook. This, uh, it, for those of you who have Facebook, it pops up people who you may know. And there was a girl from high school who was there, and I thought, wow, I haven't thought about her in years. And I hit on her profile, as it's called, and I looked to see information about her, and she's kind of lived a rough life, let's just say. But whenever it said religion, what it said was, I'm a person who doesn't believe you have to go to church to have a relationship with God. Well, I know what she's saying. A lot of people say that. But I'm saying what God wants you to have is relationship not only with him, but with all of these people. He wants us to be together because God is relational. You know that phrase we use on Sunday morning, sometimes communion? You know what communion means? Common union. When we, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm really smart to come up with that, aren't I? But do you realize what we are saying when we take the Lord's Supper together? We have a common union that we believe that Jesus died and and was raised from the dead, that he died for our sins, that he is resurrected. We are saying we have a common union in Jesus Christ. That is something you may not have with your neighbors next door. It is not something that you may have with people who you work with. But when you walk in this room, there is a common union. So how dare we not talk to each other? Because we have something so incredibly special. People in other countries around the world would die to have what we have. And some do die to have what we have. It is looking like God when we are relational in the way we live and the way we worship. No other religion claims resurrection. We are part of the only one. 
We are part of the religion that claims to be the way, the truth, the life, the kingdom, the light, and on and on. No other religion claims a resurrection. Only one gave his life. Only one was executed. And only one was to be raised. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, it means that we can live forever. What he was doing was opening that portal and going through that portal so that now we can go through that portal into the afterlife with him, something that no other religion can do. But Jesus did by his perfect life and by his father raising him. <coughs> Another well-known, probably the most well-known man alive who defends God as being real and active is Ravi Zacharias. And Ravi Zacharias wrote this. It's fairly long as well. I'm against long quotes, incidentally, and I have two tonight. It was Jesus' resurrection that changed the lives of the disciples. After Jesus was crucified, the disciples ran and hid. But when they saw the risen Lord, they knew that all Jesus had said and done proved that he was indeed God in flesh. No other religious leader has died in full view of trained executioners, had a guarded tomb, and then rose three days later to appear to many people. The resurrection is proof of who Jesus is and that he did accomplish what he set out to do, to provide the only means of redemption for mankind. Buddha did not rise from the dead. Muhammad did not rise from the dead. Confucius did not rise from the dead. Krishna did not rise from the dead. Only Jesus has physically risen from the dead, walked on water, claimed to be God, and raised others from the dead. He has conquered death. Only in Christianity do we have the person of Christ who claimed to be God, performed many miracles to, to, to prove his claim of divinity, died and rose from the dead, and claimed that he alone is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. I know that was long, but I hope you can grasp it. No God, no religious leader died for his people and was raised from the dead except Jesus. That is one of the things that makes Christianity so unique. And I'll tell you one of the things that makes me believe it so much is that those who saw him died for their faith. You know, it'd be something today if I died for my faith, you would say, wow, David's a martyr. He died for his faith. He really believed it. And I think I would be willing to die for my faith. Sometimes, some days I'm not willing to live for it, but I think I'd be willing to die for it. I want to live for it. But you would say, wow, that's good. But you see, the issue is I didn't see Jesus in the flesh. And I didn't see him resurrected. But Peter saw him in the flesh. And, and Andrew saw him in the flesh. And Bartholomew saw him in the flesh and all the others before the cross and after the resurrection. And they were willing to die for what they saw and what they heard. That is incredible. That Jesus and his Father are unique in such a wonderful way. Through resurrection, we have eternal life. Because of resurrection, we can live with Jesus forever. One of the things that is so hard for me to do, is, obviously, is to do funerals for folks. And we, if you're a preacher, you do funerals. It's part of it. But one of the things that I always think about when a Christian dies is about what they will never hear again. That they will never hear words like hate and divorce and terrorism and murder ever, ever 
again. That they will be with God forever. And I long for that. I don't want to die. Not yet. I mean, it's not that I'm afraid to be with God, but I'm afraid to leave still. But to be with God forever, do you know how incredible that is? A place that's perfect through resurrection that Jesus says that we can have, that we can have eternal life as well. Someone asked me about this, and a few of you asked me last year. A couple of years ago, I told you the story of a woman in our congregation who was Muslim that, that came to us and over time um, was baptized into Christ. And she is still faithful to God in a way that's a little bit different than some of us probably are, not in what we would call a um, standard way, maybe a conventional way. Her husband does not allow her to come to the worship service, and now because she told him what she was doing, he put a stop to that, but she watches our streaming online every week, and sometimes she will write to me emails about what I preached about, and, and, and we'll have a conversation about it. He works during the week, so she goes to ladies' Bible class every Tuesday morning. And he allows Christian women to go over to their house and visit with her. She had a baby, her second child. And he even came to the church building for the baby shower. He was willing to be there for that. I talked to him the whole time he was there. I really thought we had made some inroads that day, but I'm not sure that we did. I think we've gone a little bit backwards since. But you know, she sees Jesus. And she says, that is the way. That is different than what I grew up with, but he is the way. And I can't help, he, she says, I can't help but follow the one who is the way and the truth and the life. Well, in the meantime, and, and by this time last year, there was another woman who had come to us. A man showed up at church one day. I had never met him before. I don't even know how he found us. He came in. He, was, he uh, is, a, is a bartender from Syria, and he's Christian. I don't know. I don't think he is in practice, but he calls himself Christian. And he went to one of the other ministers, and the other minister came over to me and said, this woman needs help. I have met her along the way. She needs help. We said, well, what's the issue? She said, well, I'm from Saudi Arabia. I went to the University of Texas, San Antonio. I got a master's degree there. My husband was also going to school there. And he decided to divorce me, leave, my chi leave our child, and go back and fight against Yemen. As you know, there's a war going on between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And left me here, and I ended up in Houston. She said, I need help. We've helped her along the way. We have a family who lived in Saudi Arabia for years and did lots of interesting things while they were there. And she eventually was baptized into Christ as well. She's in the midst of getting asylum. She's within just inches of it right now. After coming the first time to church, and, and I talked to her daughter, we, uh, the teacher gave her daughter a Bible because she didn't have one. And that afternoon, she talked to her mother on the phone in Saudi Arabia. And then the mother said, hey, I want to talk to my granddaughter. And so the grand, she said to the granddaughter, what did you do today? She said, I went to church. She said, you did what? We went to church. They gave me a Bible. She said, I want to talk to your mother. And she got back on the phone and she said, I'm sending your brother to the United States to cut your neck. And she said, you get ready. Well, that's pretty scary. She said, I will not back down because Jesus is my Savior. I will not back down. When we truly believe that Jesus is the way, that he's the truth, and the life, we do not back down. Sometimes it becomes so easy for us because we live where it's we're not standing up for our faith. A few years ago, I have time to tell you one more story. I'm watching my time. Back, I guess this was probably in about 2000, 2003 or four. 
we were living in Oklahoma City and we were looking for a minivan. And uh, as we looked around different places, we were looking for a used minivan. I remember we stopped at one place. My wife actually ran in. I stayed in the car with our kids. And she came back out and she said, hey, they said they had what we wanted, the exact thing we're looking for. So we go out and I'm starting to talk to this man who's, who's the car salesman. We start talking for, for a while, and I can tell he has an accent, and I always try to bring up Jesus somehow when I'm talking to people, somehow to see if they're, put out the hook, see if they're interested. And I said, I can tell by your accent, maybe you didn't grow up here. He said, no, I'm from Russia. I said, Russia, wow, that's interesting. And uh, I thought, what do I know to talk to him about that? Well, in Bra I said, well, I lived in Brazil, and they had, I, where I said, did you own a Lada, which is a Russian car? He said, how in the world do you know about Ladas? He said, those were worse than Hugo's. I said, I know. I said, well, I was a missionary in Brazil, and they sold them in Brazil. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, well, it's okay. I didn't buy one. <laughs> but I said, how did you get to the United States? He said, well, I came to the United States to go to Oklahoma Christian University. I said, really? So did I. I said, so did I. Well, I didn't come to the U.S. for that, but I came here for that. Really? And I said, so are you a member of the Church of Christ? He said, I was a member of the first legally recognized Church of Christ in all of Russia. And he said, oh, and I said, what was it like before that? He said, oh, he said it was so difficult. He said we would take our Bible and we would put in a bag and we would go to an apartment and we would have a service and we would try to whisper as we, as we sang our songs, we would whisper them. And then we would all decide, okay, next week we're going to have the service at such and such place. And then we would meet there because we didn't want to get caught. He wasn't a member of the Communist Party, but he worked for the party. And so he said, oh, it was, it was invigorating as we would go through all of this. And so he said, I came here to study business and go back. I said, wow, that is tremendous. I said, so where do you go to church now? He said, well, I don't go to church anymore. I said, why don't you go to church? He said, you know, I just got here and it's so easy that I just stopped going. Well, we bought the minivan from him and I told him, if you do not come to church tomorrow morning, it was a Saturday, I am bringing this thing back. <laughs> he was there. But as far as I know, it was the last time he was ever there. I pray somehow he found his way. But does it get too easy for us to realize that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life? He is our resurrection. And he says we can live with him forever. Let's be that kind of people. Amen? David, thanks so much for being here tonight. Thanks for being who you are. And I appreciate you for reminding us and explaining to us so clearly Jesus is the way, the truth.